Good evening, members of council, audience, and viewing audience who are joining us on YouTube. Thank you for joining us. Um, like to read a land acknowledgement statement before we begin. We acknowledge that the ground on which we live is the traditional territory of Codwell First Nation of the Three Fires Confederacy and the original people of Point Pelee and Pelee Island and its surrounding lands and waters and that of the Huron Wendat and Wyandot peoples. We recognize and respect the First Nations who are stewards of the land and waters of Turtle Island and who, who have embraced this stewardship since time immemorial. We would also like to acknowledge the contributions of other nearby First Nation communities and all original people across Turtle Island. We'll take a moment of silent reflection and then we'll stand to sing our national anthem. Members of council, you've had a chance to look at items on the agenda. Is there any notice of conflict of interest? Seeing none, adopt to the minutes. The meeting held April 12th, 2022 be adopted as presented. Moved by Councillor Carrick, support Councillor Desjarle. All in favor? That carries, thank you. You'll have to excuse me. I'm looking at my computer because there are councillors joining from home in here. So if you see me doing a lot of head turning, I'm just trying to stay on top of things. Mayor's comments, I have a couple. The Windsor Essex County Health Unit is holding a COVID-19 vaccine pop-up clinic here at the Town Civic Center in the atrium tomorrow from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. No appointment needed. Visit the Health Unit website for all COVID-19 related information. It's that time of year when summer sports are gearing up for the season. LaSalle Turtle Club Baseball is celebrating their opening day this coming Saturday with their annual Turtle Club Parade for the first time in two years. And a lot of us will be there and I'll be there with some of my grandsons. The parade route will be closed to traffic on Saturday morning for approximately an hour and a half. Visit the news page on our website for full details, including road closures. Cheer on the players if you see them along the parade route this weekend. We wish them a fun season. Council and administration would also like to acknowledge the work of our parks crew. Spring has been a bit late this year and the blooms are just now starting to open up. They look fantastic around LaSalle and we've been hearing positive comments and compliments. So job well done to our parks crew. Um, and just a side note, I attended the warden's banquet this afternoon and some members of administration were there to support our warden Gary McNamara and he brought some uh, good comments on where we've been and where we're heading. So the future looks bright for this area with all the uh, news announcements of new corporations setting up. And Mr. Militia is gonna add some comments. <clears throat> uh, good evening, everyone. Just for the viewing audience, you will see something a little different. This is our first open council meeting where we have um, more than the usual folks here in the uh, council chambers. Uh, and so we have members of administration here as well as members of the public are welcome. Uh, we currently have uh, Councillor Carrick and Councillor Dujarle online with us. And then we have Deputy Mayor Malosh 
Uh, obviously, Mayor uh, Bondi, uh, Councillor Reno, Councillor Akpata, and Councillor Riccio Spaniolo here in the uh, in the council chamber. So those that are viewing on the the uh, sorry viewing online will see a little different view. Uh, you'll see two views: one of the council table and one of the remaining council chambers, uh, as well as those individuals that are attending online. So it's a little different. We're trying this out for the next couple of meetings to see how effective it is uh, before we have to make any further investment. Uh, in, uh, in any technology of that sort. So again, welcome to all. Welcome to those that are, are here in attendance and uh, those that are viewing, obviously, from home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Melissa. And he's going to explain why you see my head going right to left and straight, trying to see all the council members. Right now, we have a presentation. We are uh, honored to have the president of LaSalle Minor Hockey Association and a good friend, Mike Seagay, and vice president of travel, Randy Levac. If you'll please come forward. Can you put your, yeah, you. It's familiar surroundings in a different place. Uh, good evening, uh, Your Worship Mayor Mark Bondi, members of Town Council, Administration, and staff. I'm here tonight with the LaSalle Minor Hockey Association Vice President of Travel and longtime volunteer Randy Levac. Linda Thiessen, our scheduling director, is unfortunately not able to attend the meeting tonight due to a conflict with her work schedule. We are here to formally recognize and celebrate the significant contribution that employees of the Town of LaSalle recreational staff have made in supporting the LMHA programming over the past year. We are sure that the Town of LaSalle is well aware of the many challenges that the community has been facing during the pandemic. The LMHA Board of Directors has worked closely with the Volmer Recreational Center staff in order to efficiently and effectively address the impact of policy and directives on programming, in many instances, having to pivot operational procedures with limited notice. Through this collaboration, the LMHA was able to identify, understand and communicate any programming impacts to our membership quickly, which helped to limit concern with required to programming updates. Throughout this pandemic, the Town of the Cell Recreational staff prioritized the provision of safe, high quality services to our membership while remaining steadfast to some of the key strategic values of the town of the cell, including operational excellence, providing for a high quality of life and improving community engagement. As difficult and challenging as it was for the volunteers of our organization, the process was made palatable due to the diligent and dedicated support of the Volmer staff. The LMHA deeply values the partnership we enjoy with the staff of the Town of LaSalle. The LaSalle Minor Hockey Association's President's Award is given annually to the person or persons who have gone beyond expectation to serve their hockey community and in doing so, have provided the support and means to achieve organizational success. For the first time in the LMHA's history, the President's Award by unanimous decision by the LMHA Board of Directors is awarded to persons external to the organization. For exemplary service to LaSalle Minor Hockey Association, the President's Award goes to four individuals who through their strong commitment and dedicated unselfish service to minor hockey in LaSalle have made a positive impact on the success of the activity. It is therefore our privilege to recognize the 2021-2022 honorees, Owen Stitchholler, Scott Bisson, Jordan Refuse and Mark Mazanovich. If, if yeah. the awardees want to come forward and uh, Mr. Seagay and Mr. Levac can present them with their trophies.
I'm just going to say a couple words and then Mr. Militia. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to, I always say Team LaSalle, but, and we don't recognize our people enough. I'm not saying Joe's not doing his job, but there's so many, what do we have? 200 and something FTEs, full time equivalents, something like that. And I don't know them all, but it's nice that they're recognized. You make us, Council, you make us look good by doing your job. So it doesn't go unappreciated, which is to be recognized by LMHA first time in their history. They've been around a long time because I played hockey there when I was five years old. So um, that's almost 60 years. So thank you. And um, what I've heard through administration is you've been good to work with. We've get a lot of complaints about COVID and the policy we, we've implemented, but it's nice to be recognized that we're working for the safety of the kids and young adults playing the game. So thank you for recognizing that. And Mr. Militia. Yeah, again, I just want to take the time to, to thank you for recognizing our staff because it, it is a, an extreme honor, particularly uh, to get something like this bestowed to them uh, outside of the organization. And that does not go unnoticed. Uh, I would also like to say that I think I think congratulations also needs to be uh, needs to be given to the, uh, the LaSalle Minor Hockey Association. You guys have done an exemplary job during a very, very difficult time. Um, you know, we, we know what it's like when you get you have a, a, a population base that's pushing one way and you have a, a board that perhaps is seeing something a little different and trying to protect the kids. And, and that's what a lot of what we have done. And, and I think uh, we, I would say that our relationship has never been stronger and we're very proud of that. And we, we commit to continuing to work towards that. Uh, a lot of the things that have happened over the, over the COVID pandemic and not that it's over, but uh, hopefully we're getting closer to the end. Um, but a lot of the events that have happened, the open, the closures, the, the openings, the modified schedules, um, the, the how we handle the dressing rooms, how we handle the ice, how we handle the benches, all of those. Uh, I think we, you know, the team that we see in the back uh, headed up by Patty uh, Fornaro, who's our, our director. I mean, they've done a phenomenal job of communicating and continuing to keep everyone in the loop. And also I, I think from, from, the, uh, from the board's perspective, you have been very supportive of our, of our decisions. I know some of them probably didn't make you very happy. And, but I think, Ultimately, at the end of the day, you were able to communicate that with us, and we were able to make adjustments where we could to make it work for both of us. So I, I think uh, congratulations to your organization getting through a very, very difficult two years. Hopefully, it's behind us, and hopefully the September uh, startup brings a, a much fresh, I'm going to say a much fresh old look uh, to, uh, to minor hockey here in LaSalle. But uh, I, like I said, congratulations to your organization getting through a, a very difficult time, and, and certainly congratulations to our staff in the back. Uh, you're, Mr. Mayor, you're right. We don't do enough to con congratulate our staff. And it's great that we get opportunities like this to, to individually. I know they're very ecstatic to be being pointed out this way, uh, but, uh, but I will say <clears throat> we are very proud of them and we're glad that they are working with our community partners to, to bring services to the community that everyone needs to enjoy. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the kind words from both. Uh, the, the open and honest communication has been a real bonus as far as, far as our collegial relationship that we had. So I, I really appreciate the fact that you mentioned that. And I also wanted to mention uh, that this, although this award is this 2021, 2022, uh, I would be remiss without saying that Patty for now uh, started the ball rolling as far as dealing with this pandemic and especially during the tougher times. So uh, we want Patty to know that although this is this year, we do recognize the year before that uh, she did a lot of the great work. So thank you, Patty, for all that you did as well. And uh, certainly it was an honor for us to be here today and uh, well-deserved by the four people here. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll move on to report E1, procedural bylaw 8692. We have our clerk, Director of Council Services, Clerk Jennifer Estrologo. Uh, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. So what you have before you this evening is um, a draft version of the procedure bylaw, which has been revised. Um, this is coming back to council as promised from the April 12th meeting. Um, in my report, I have highlighted a number of changes um, and, and mainly highlighted the big changes. Um, 
I can appreciate that the bylaw probably looks a little bit different from the previous version of the bylaw, but many of the provisions um, and the requirements and the rules um, with respect to our meetings remain largely the same. So I'm just gonna take this opportunity to review a couple of the major changes to this bylaw. Um, and one of them is uh, this you know, electronic conferencing Zoom platform provisions that we've included. Um, as you are all aware, uh, the Municipal Act has been amended to allow for that outside of a, um, an emergency and council, if they choose to, can implement such, um, can implement these types of provisions to allow for this type of uh, remote participation for not only council members, but for members of the public, members and members of administration. So that's one of the, uh, the bigger changes that have been made in the procedure bylaw. The other change that has been made is with respect to delegations and presentations. And um, all I really, um, all we really did there was to outline how various types of delegations um, can register through the clerk's office to appear before council to speak. Um, right now, uh, there is still um, a registration process, but what we did was we updated the timelines and clarified the process and the conduct expectations so that not only is council aware of how we operate in terms of registering delegations, but the public will also be um, aware of that. So those are really the two biggest changes in the, in the bylaw. There are other changes where we've clarified some headings, um, consolidated some headings in the agenda itself, just to you know for efficiency for the agenda. And then um, the other uh, issue that I've touched on was the motion to reconsider. And really that's just a clarification, not only for council, but for the public. So subject to any questions, um, I'm asking tonight that council adopt the procedure bylaw and we move forward with the new uh, bylaw as drafted. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Open to council for questions. Councillor DeGerley. Thank you, uh, through you, Mayor Bondi. This is something that I've had um, calls from residents on and I, I'll, I'll admit I didn't really think that um, our residents compared us and the county and things that we do similarly. Um, I know that the county just recently changed as well about electronic meetings and their parameters are three times a year and only from Canada, not for budget or not for inaugural. And I've had residents from LaSalle asking me um, if the four meetings per calendar year, if the person attending has to be in the country. And I said, I'm reading it not, but I just said I would clarify it, please and thank you. Yeah, there isn't such a requirement. Um, the way I uh, approached the bylaw when I drafted it was if you're going to participate remotely, um, you can really participate from any anywhere, um, regardless of whether you're in the country or not. Um, it, it's really, it's meant to, the remote participation is really meant to provide another avenue for council members to participate. You know, in the event of illness, emergency, vacation, and perhaps there's something on the agenda that they really want to be able to participate in, they would be able to participate in the meeting. Okay, that works for me, thank you. Um, I mean, this was a very challenging piece of reading, um, but it, it's interesting and I like some of the clarifications and the combinations that you put together, so I appreciate the time into it. And I would at this point, um, make a motion to endorse the provisions. So you're you're moving that recommendation, Councillor DeGerle, okay. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Dicho Spagnolo, discussion on the motion. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Councillor Akpada, then Deputy Mayor Malosh. <laughs> I have one question, Your Worship, and whoever can answer it, it's, and it's technical. As far as the storage of our meetings, where are the meetings going to be stored? Who controls them? And is it if the storer should lose their business, how does the meetings that we've captured remain accessible by members of the public? So under the Municipal Act, the actual official record of the meeting is the minutes. So the minutes we store um, electronically. So th that is the official record. I presume that you're also asking about the um, electronic storage of the video recording. So those are a benefit that we provide to the public. Those are currently with YouTube. Um, I don't know what happens to those um, 
recordings if YouTube no longer exists. I assume that I, I'm fairly certain, and I know IT assists us with these meetings and would have looked into this, but I believe that once these get uploaded to YouTube, they are property of YouTube. I don't believe we have that property, um, those property rights anymore to the recording. I've got a subsequent, Your Worship, if that's all right. So just so I understand, and the people who've contacted me, it's not the recording of the meeting that is necessity under the legislation. Can you just mention that again with the with the necessity of the meeting is, please? Yeah, so we are required to record minutes. So the written minutes that we provide to council, that, that council adopts at the beginning of every meeting, those are the official record of the minutes. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Do you want to add something, Mr. Longwa? Yes, I just spoke with our manager of IT. Uh, we do have the ability to download all of the meetings that are recorded on YouTube as an MP4 and store them in our within our system. Correct, but it's not a requirement under the Municipal Act for the minutes. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor Malosh. Thank you, Mayor Bondi. Um, well, I agree with most of what's in this uh, bylaw that's being presented to us. I think I have two concerns with it. Um, while yes, this is the new way of our future is a lot of online things and it's cost saving to presentations that'll come before us for people who are coming from far away, especially when there's bad weather. Um, but I think when we talk about council especially, I really truly believe that we should be here in person um, unless we're ill and we are dealing with a pandemic and we're not saying it's done in a year or two, it could be on forever. And having that option to join these meetings from home is a great benefit. And I, I think I agree with that portion of it, but I don't believe we should be on vacation and signing into a council meeting. I don't think that's appropriate. I think um, having three or four days to say that, you know, we, we quantify it by saying, yes, we're ill, there's an emergency, there's some reason we cannot be in the building. Um, and then my other concern is um, with chairing meetings. I think it would be extremely difficult if our chair wasn't in the building. I, I actually, unless there's a new way that we could figure this out, I think it would be very hard for us to sit here and be looking up at the screen for our chair um, and it would lose something. We, all, we say now that not being together, we lose information. We don't have the same feeling in our meetings. And I think that would happen because our chair is the person who binds all of us. They're the person who speaks to whoever our delegate is, our administration. And I think it's very important that our chair is in here in person. And I don't want it to be, you know, un unfortunate or unfair to the leader, but I do feel that if you're going to chair the meeting that you should be here in person. And I would like to see us look at this bylaw in a way where um, the four meetings are, are again, you're, you're missing for a good reason. We're not missing just because we've decided that we're taking vacation because I've taken vacation and I did in December. I had it booked, unfortunately, and timing didn't work out well for our budgets. And I decided not to sign in because I just didn't think it was on my, my opinion that I wasn't feeling comfortable doing it that way. So I would look at maybe including a stipulation of the why we take those four meetings. I don't know if that's a possibility, but that's just my feeling on it. Councillor Reynolds. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> Concerning the, the vacation, what you're doing, what you're not doing, um, and, and why you're choosing to, to participate, um, as we all know, things come up all the time. Um, I, I always get a chuckle and my wife gets a chuckle because I get so many uh, requests that I need to send to administration, usually at around quarter after four on Friday afternoon. Everybody comes out of the woodwork. Um, and we all know that things come out of the woodwork constantly. And I probably have messages on my phone right now about things that are going to happen today. And um, if if I had left town for whatever reason, whether it be to be with family or to be on vacation, and there was an issue that I felt that I needed to represent, um, I would like the opportunity to be able to zoom in and represent the people that have asked me for their help. Um, I don't think there should be a stipulation of whether you're on vacation or if you're in mourning. 
I think that's a personal choice. If you are on vacation and you feel that you need an electronic break or you need a break from the town and that's why you're on your vacation, then don't zoom in. But if you feel that you have something um, that is worthy and something that is important that you need to be part of the conversation, I think you should have that, and it shouldn't be uh, you should you shouldn't be marginalized whether it's vacation or or mourning or sickness or whatever. So that's just my personal opinion on that. Um, as for the chair, <clears throat> it's not it's not nice to pick on anybody. Okay, and we're kind of going to pick on the chair. Um, I, yeah, and, and respectfully, um, I do agree with the fact that we are a collection of people in this room and, and our chair controls the meeting with not the control is not a very nice word, but, but he, he leads the meeting and he, he, he molds the meeting and, and how things are going to move. And I think if he was the only head up on the screen and we were all at the party and he was on the screen, I, I think it would, it, it would be, um, it, it wouldn't work as well, that, in my own personal opinion. And I, and I do feel that that the person who is, is leading the meeting should be here as well. Um, and, you know, we're only talking three or four times a year and it might not even happen. But um, I do believe that we have a deputy mayor uh, who has the ability to step in. And if the deputy mayor uh, decides to zoom in, uh, uh, just so happens that uh, both of you have zoomed in, there's also a senior member of council that can step in. And I think as part of, uh, of, of growing your team uh, is, is opening those opportunities to them as well um, to be able to grow and, uh, and so that there's a bit of a succession moving forward uh, in the future. So uh, I, I support um, uh, a ch the, the conversation of, of having the, the chair uh, at the meeting live. Um, and if it could be, I, I think that um, there's, there's different rules in the, in, the, in the bylaw that I read about how the chair um, abdicates uh, at certain times and sits back and lets the second person. You know, I, I definitely would not want to uh, not include the the chair or the normal chair the mayor i would not want to disinclude him uh in any way i would like him then to uh, move to be one of the council the sitting council and then the chair would still make the the final decision and break the tie that's my personal opinion uh for for further clarification councillor dicho spagnol thank you through you um, I appreciate having the the bylaw in place for us to have to have that uh, flexibility if we had to have um, go on zoom for our meetings with our work schedules and children and activities and things like that. I'm not saying on a, on a biweekly um, situation. However, there are times that things do come up um, as well as if we were to leave town for a uh, conference. I know that I'm heading to a conference coming up and it will be affecting a uh, council meeting. I would like to sign on during that conference. So I, I support this. I think that it's, um, it's a great opportunity for flexibility and in the virtual world that we're all living in. And I think the pandemic has heightened that and people have seen that we have been able to work remotely. And um, I, I take the role as a counselor seriously, um, so I wouldn't be taking advantage of this, but I think it's a great opportunity and um, great flexibility for us to, to be able to have. Thank you. Councillor Carrick. I'm okay with the bylaw the way it is. I think that uh, the mayor is the head, no matter what or where he's at. If he wants to chair the meeting, that's fine with me. I do like the opportunity though, to be able to do it from home on these spur of the moments as of tonight. If uh, you're feeling a little under the weather or other things are going on, at least you have the opportunities to participate or on vacation or you're even out of the country. I'm okay with that because it's our job to be here to make the votes and to, to pass bylaws and to, to be part of the process. So nothing's gonna happen every meeting, but at the same time, I'm still okay with uh, with how it's written up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Akpata. Thank you, Worship. Most recently, my old career caught up with me and I got a court notice to go to court on a case from 2012. Uh, it was all done electronically, including the lawyers. The only persons who were there was the justice of the peace and the accused. So from, my, from, from simply using that as an example, I believe to my colleague's point, I'd like to see the person who is here chair 
I'm not going to suggest it be you, your worship, but I appreciate the chair being here. And I also appreciate the opportunity if I'm somewhere for whatever reason, as my colleague said, going to a conference or coming down the 401 quickly, as I did today, and doing it safely that you can participate. Uh, I believe that the world has changed. And the amendment to this act and piece of legislation, if we go back to when we first started, it was illegal and you couldn't do it. But the world has moved and it's changed. If court can do it, I believe that we can do it. I don't want us to get into specific reasons. I like the four opportunities and then after that permission of counsel. Um, I, I believe looking at my colleagues here and looking at the administration in the room, everyone here is conscientious. We understand who we represent and we understand what our responsibilities are. And I'm comfortable saying that in public about everybody in this room. And I don't believe that there would be a perceived abuse of the authority or the power. So with my colleagues' uh, points, I take them, but I just, I just want to see the chair here. It doesn't matter who the chair is. And I, I don't believe that we need to notify why we are attending electronically as long as you conscientiously attend and you don't exceed more than four. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Councillor Carrick. Before, before we get too far down this road, the mayor is the mayor, right? If he can, if he can be there virtually or physically, he's still the mayor. He can't be an alternate. He has to be the mayor if he's, if he's in the meeting. Is that not correct, especially for a council meeting? I just need some clarification. Yes, he's always the mayor. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't change wherever he's participating from. Um, I, I I think what can be done is, if I'm hearing what some of the council members are speaking about, is putting qualification on who leads the meetings, and that's that is in council's jurisdiction to make provisions in their bylaw. When, when the bylaw was drafted and I worked with uh, my team in the clerk's office and I worked with the CAO and we discussed what would work for LaSalle, we took all of that into consideration when we were preparing the provisions of the bylaw. So what we have presented is what administration feels will work for this council and, and, count, and future councils. Um, but it, it, this is the bylaw which governs your proceedings and it is certainly within councils um, jurisdiction to advise and, and, and bring motions as to how it needs to change or tell us how it needs to change. And if we have to bring it back, then we have to bring it back. Oh, okay. I certainly sounds like a lot of thoughts have gone into this, but at the same time, I don't, I'm not comfortable with the mayor being in a meeting and not chairing the meeting, especially at a council meeting. That's just how I feel. So I want to support that portion of the bylaw if, if it does pass. Thank you, Councillor Carrick. I guess I should, oh, Councillor DeGerley. Thank you, um, through you too. I would perhaps then suggest a friendly amendment that we do request that the chair be present um, in person, uh, if possible, for the meetings. Um, it is something I've had people comment on, um, not to pick on anybody who's here or not here, um, but people have asked that um, they like to see the, the members of council present um, in the building or knowing that they're in the community doing their jobs. And I would suggest that that might be an amendment uh, that I would make to the four meetings per calendar year, um, add that the chairperson be uh, on site. Just some comments. Of course, all the fingers and comments are pointing to me because I'm the chair. And with all due respect to all their council members, no one's had that chair other than replacing myself. So I don't like that idea. I, I agree with Councillor Carrick. Uh, with the technology present, and let's face it, I'm not going to be here forever, at least till April 1st. We'll see what happens after the election. It might be one of you up here. And for whatever reason, why you're out of town, you're getting complaints, uh, Councillor Dujerly, about they want us present. There hasn't been a meeting, to my knowledge, where we had a in-camera, sorry, an in-person meeting, and the chair wasn't here since COVID. So now we're starting this new process. So if the chair, I, I, I don't want to say me because it might be next year 
or two years or five years, whenever that somebody's sitting in this chair and they're in Toronto for a wedding and snowstorm comes up, they can't join the meeting. So they're joining and now they're not the chair. And it, it, maybe they don't join the meeting at all for whatever reason. And now we're having a six and it becomes a draw. I think we should have the full complement of council members, chair included, wherever they are, for whatever reason, and personal reasons don't have to be disclosed. If you can't make it, you can't make it. But if you're not in Canada or in Windsor or, sorry, in LaSalle, and you want to attend because the electoral residents voted for us to represent them, and now we're saying, yeah, you can, you can join the meeting, but you can't be the chair. I don't buy that. And I think if anybody here was sitting as a chair or acting chair and saying you can't be the chair because you can't join in person, I think it, it's a conflict of what the people elected us for. I agree with your comment, Councillor Desjardins, where you said they want us here. That's our job. Your job as councillors is to be here as councillors. Deputy Mayor Malosh is her job to be here as Deputy Mayor, and mine is to be here as the Mayor and the Chair. So. I say this not to be confrontational, but I don't agree with this. And I'm speaking for past mayors and future mayors that no, if you're here, you're the chair. That's how the show goes. Now, if somebody wants to make a motion to approve this or make amendments to it, that's fine. But that's how I see this. And I just say again, respectfully, until you sit here and do it, and sometimes it's discussions we've had with administration that there's other factors that are not known to everyone, not on purpose, it just happens. And then you go, oh, well, this is not the way it should be, or how about this? But if you can't share it and give out more information, or I think uh, it was made that I should be present, sorry, the mayor should be present, but not chair. I don't agree with that either. If you're here, you're the chair, whether it's electronically or not. Yes, we've gone through COVID, which has changed the way we do things. The dynamics are not the same. We, it's nice to have most council members here tonight. Some couldn't for whatever reasons, that's okay. But it's nice just to have a little cohesiveness again. I think things will go back to normal. I don't perceive me not making a meeting, at least in the foreseeable future. I don't know what can come up. But if I do make it and the residents want you there, I think they want you as what they elected you for. That's my feelings on that. I'm not sure if uh, any other council members have a comment. Deputy Mayor Malosh. Thank you, Mayor Bondi. I don't, uh, I agree with what you're saying. Like anybody who takes that chair, that's your position is to chair that meeting. I think I'm still trying to figure out how we're going to do this. Like when I look at that little screen, when you think of it at home, to, to chair the meeting at home and be trying to look at council on that little screen and then council chambers and I couldn't point out anybody in administration on that screen if I tried to or who's raising their hand I just think the operation of the meeting would be more of a challenge if the chair itself who's supposed to be calling on people can't see the people so unless we come up with something technically different to be able to manage that I think that's where some of the problem would come up and why I say we lose that cohesiveness of, of council like we are all very excited today to be in able to discuss things with each other and without the chair here you're missing that component so I don't know if maybe you know if, if you want to approve this with a trial of a year and a year from now revisit I mean a year from now this may be moot point and we're always here all the time and that may be it but I just I think we're looking at it could be very challenging Mr. Militia if perhaps I can just add some context to some of the comments that we've heard uh, from members of council so I, I think, uh, you know, Mr. Astrologo has indicated, and, and it's, it's absolutely true that the procedural bylaw is a council driven bylaw. We operate under that and it is how the council meetings are run. So council members need to be happy with how that bylaw is, is outlined. I, I can tell you that in drafting the bylaw, the, the two areas that, that we hear, uh, again, that there are some, some concerns with was uh, first on, on participation while on vacation effectively. And so we viewed it from this perspective, <clears throat> partly because we've gone through two years of COVID and it's been a learning experience all the way through. So from our perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, 
again, and, and we're, we're, we anticipate that if members of council, members of council will be absent from the meeting, again, in in-person meeting and participating virtually in one of, for one of three or four reasons. One would be illness, one would be isolation, uh, which we've learned through COVID. Uh, one would be a work commitment, and, and and the last would be vacation. And so, regardless of where that vacation is, and regardless of 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 how that's undertaken, or whether it's a work commitment, or whether it's it's all those other things, if you are at home and barring, we would anticipate that you'd be in the chambers unless you're isolating or or not well. So that's what our anticipation is, and and what the the concept was behind writing the bylaw is that the, the whole idea of absence was based around those three or four incident, in, incidences. And that's why we limited it to four times a year uh, and unless otherwise approved by council. So that's kind of a bit of background as to why that was constructed and, and written in that fashion. Um, the, the second part was uh, regarding the chair's role. So, you know, I, I think it's been noted from a few members of council, obviously the mayor has also noted that, you know, again, that the, the electorate will vote in positions, obviously. And, and we struggled a little bit with this and trying to understand how do, we, how do we view this? And part of what we came back with was everyone is a member of council and we should treat everyone the same. And that's why the, the recommendations don't, dis, don't disseminate or, or differentiate between a member of council, the deputy mayor or the mayor. And so that is why we, we did this. I, I think, quite honestly, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Malosh, the, the, the concept of passing potentially this bylaw if council were to, to do that tonight, and then bringing it back in a year's time to see how well it has worked, I think, it, I think that is a rational argument, uh, because this is the first time we've actually codified, if you will, the whole virtualization of meetings or partial virtualization of meetings. We've been doing this for two years under the emergency provisions of the act. However, you know, th this will be the time when we actually codify it, if you will. Uh, so I, I don't think that it, it is unreasonable to, to suggest that we, we, we pass, if council is so willing to pass the bylaw tonight, and then we effectively keep some, uh, so a running tally of some of the issues that we might have over the next 12 or, or 16 months, and then come back perhaps, let's, let's just say July or the summer of next, of next, of 2023, with a report back to council that says, these are the concerns that were raised. These are the ones that have materialized, these are the not. And, and I would agree with you. I think when we, we may have to invest in some more technology because perhaps it's a little difficult to run the meeting with the visuals that you see right now. So we may have to do that. We're, we're not doing that yet because we're trying to see how this is working out. We don't wanna make a foolish investment just to make a quick investment. Uh, so we're, we're going through that process, but perhaps that's, that's a bit of an argument. I, I, I would say that some of the discussion points will still be valid, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's a month or a year or a year and a half from now, in that, uh, you know, the, the chair's role, the mayor's role is the chair's role, is the mayor's role, is the deputy mayor's role, is the members of council role. So if, if council is so willing, we can certainly bring this back within a year's time or so and, and commit to come back. I'm gonna suggest, I, I want to give our council services area some time because despite the election being at the end of October, um, there is some post-election activity that happens well into 2023. So for us to come back in a year's time, maybe a, in a 12 month period might be a little bit difficult. So I would say perhaps if we come back mid-year next year with a report, if that's amenable to council, we can certainly do that and, uh, and, and certainly cycle back on some of the concerns that were raised. We can also, during that time, we'll also be able to tally and pull other, other municipalities to see how they're handling it, because I would imagine that there would, might be some variety of how how that's being handled across the board. Councillor Akpata. Your Worship, I would take but uh, Mr. Militia's words and I uh, attach them to the motion. I'm, I'm happy that Mr. Militia's got a plan that we can look and see how it works. And we might be looking at a pot that doesn't boil. Uh, and if I can ask, Ms. if I can ask just a, a, a point here, the mayor's the mayor, the chair is the chair. And the legislation says that the chair runs the meeting, if I understand correctly. 
And we can do that electronically. And with Mr. Malicious points, if we review this in a year and there's substantial problem, obviously it will become known. And as Mr. Militia has reminded us, as we own the bylaw, we can amend, is the word immediately something you, that you can use in the political environment? Yeah, I mean, the bylaw can be amended fairly quickly if we recognize that there's an issue. So if council's identified an issue, I mean, it shouldn't take long to amend. Thank you, Your Worship. Just so I'm clear, Mr. Mayor, just I just want to be clear. Okay. This was Councillor, uh, sorry, Deputy Mayor Malash's. As much as I love taking credit for everybody's <laughs> ideas and things like that, it was actually her idea. So is that a motion? You're you're ma making this to approve the recommendation with a July 2023 timeframe? Yes, Your Worship. Okay. Second, or do you want to speak? You'll second? Okay, so Councillor Venno seconds, and we're discussing on the motion. Okay, Councillor DeJarley. Thank you. I think I made that motion previously with an amendment. Okay, what was the friendly amendment? Nobody wrote, wrote it down. There okay, wasn't. we we talked about having the chair. Um, I didn't write it. I didn't write my phrase down either. Um, but I think it was about having the chair in person. Um, and I'm thinking that if for some reason you as the chair is not available, then that's when the deputy mayor would take over and or or the senior member of council is that correct but no one seconded it so i don't know if that was okay so there was no seconder we're just discussing the clarification So the, the the discussion is: Do you want to stick with that amendment, or do you want to, or you want to withdraw it, and we'll go with Councillor Akpata's friendly amendment, which is basically accept this, and then we'll go with a time frame of July twenty twenty three for the present council to review, unless an emergency is declared and they have to make changes. I think is what you said in there. That's correct, Your Worship. Okay. Okay, I'll withdraw it. Okay, so we have Councillor Pata with that friendly amendment, seconded by Councillor Reno, and you have a question. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Your Worship. More of a um, comment on some of the discussion that's just uh, happened. Um, in regards to the the chair being here, um, the comment was, you know, uh, by Deputy Mayor Malosh, I'm looking at that screen and I couldn't tell you who any of those people are. And, and that is a good point. And, um, but the fact of the matter is, is that the ability to know who's there and, and to, to mold the, this meeting is all going to lie on the chair and on the mayor. And if you feel uncomfortable, then I would expect that you would share that with us. But to be fair, um, you have the ability to do this and you do have the ability um, to, to do your best. <laughs> I think of my Cub Scouts to do your best. And I do honestly believe, uh, in, in what Councillor Akpata has said that if, if we give this a year, um, or we give this a, a proper amount of, of time frame here, um, it will become very apparent either to you or to us that this is something that's working or it's not working for the team. And I think to give you the respect, uh, of, of the next year, to be able to do it and to do your best, I think is the most important thing. And that's why I will second uh, Councillor Akpada's amendment. And I will trust that you will do your best. That's assuming there's a need to sign in electronically. So uh, any other comments? Okay. Okay, so on the motion presented, all in favor? Against, that carries, thank you.
Okay. Just for clarification, what we voted on was the friendly amendment. So now we have to vote on the actual procedural bylaw, the recommendation on the agenda. As amended, As amended. correct. Moved by Councillor Carrick. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. It was moved and seconded by. <clears throat> okay. Okay, it was moved by Councillor Dujarle and seconded by Councillor Dicho Spagnolo. All, all in favor? As amended. Against? That carries, thank you. So, so if I might just summarize for the viewing audience, because there may be some confusion again so ultimately at the end of the day council approved the 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 bylaw as presented subject to a a review that will come back to the to council in july of 2023 so just so that the viewing audience everyone understands what we just did <laughs> right, yeah, okay perfect okay now we have patty finero for our festival and event hosting recommendation Thank you. Good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. Each year, more than 50 festivals and special events are held on town property or in town facilities. Sporting tournaments, charity walks, and parades are just a few of the events that require considerable coordination across multiple internal and external departments. <clears throat> the return of events post-COVID, coupled with the opening of the event center, has demonstrated a need to update our event hosting practices. The purpose of this presentation is to outline a plan that provides the best possible experience for event organizers while also mitigating risk to the municipality. In 2021, a comprehensive review of all of the events that were hosted pre-COVID uh, within the town was completed. As part of that review, we looked at the types of events that were hosted, such as walks or runs and sport, sporting tournaments, the space required for these events, whether they be indoor or outdoor, the storage that was required, concession use, et cetera. The pre-event meetings and contact that was required uh, by event organizers to meet with staff in order to support the event. The various setup requests, such as tables and chairs, staging, pipe and drape. Additional resources that were required, such as Wi-Fi access, road closures, or police escort, for example and the overall impact of the event um, to the community, such as parking, noise, and disruption to our regular facility users. From that review, we were able to, event to identify some key uh, trends. Mm. There's currently a lack of variety in the types of events that are hosted within the town. The cost to provide the space is more than we charged. Mm. There has been significant growth in events prior to COVID and we anticipate more to come uh, with the event center opening. Often there are multiple events offered at the same time, the same weekend or back to back. There's many special requests from event organizers. So for example, special or custom walk or run routes, use of areas not meant for events, last minute changes and requests. Uh, as well as um, incentives uh, requested such as no charge for setup or takedown days. <clears throat> and also that the coordination involves uh, eight of our internal departments plus contact with outside organizations such as the AGCO and the health unit. This slide here accompanies Appendix A, which is included in today's agenda. <clears throat> the slide and the document included in the agenda gives an overall visual of the multi-departmental involvement in executing third-party events. Along the top of the slide, you'll note that the event planning stages are indicated, and along the left are the various town departments. This visual, from this visual, you will note that with the exception of the first stage of facility booking and scheduling, every other step in the process involves at least three town departments. When developing the plan, some of the things that were considered was the need to plan for a balance of events through an expression of interest process. This will help us to determine interest and ensure a variety of events are offered rather than booking on a first come first serve basis, which could potentially lead to similar events being offered one right after the other. 
Reducing or limiting town provided equipment and services will reduce the cost to the town and create efficiencies for staff. Event space will come with predetermined amenities, such as the number of picnic tables under a pavilion, for example. <clears throat> Organizers will be required to rent additional amenities from approved event suppliers or contract contractors. Excuse me. This approval process will ensure that the town has the required paperwork and records on file for these contractors. <clears throat> Restart after COVID provides, is providing us with the opportunity to change our practices with returning events. I will need to keep in mind the ongoing development of the waterfront, uh, which could affect events in future years as areas could be under construction. The plan including, includes setting and communicating clear priorities, organizing our internal resources and providing exceptional service for event organizers, ensuring financial responsibility and promoting, promoting the new event center. <clears throat> And Appendix B uh, includes the event hosting policy, which is proposed for approval tonight. This policy will provide a comprehensive information package for event organizers. It will clarify the roles and responsibilities with respect to event hosting within the town. It will help us to ensure adher adherence to regulations, bylaws, and procedures. And it should be noted that this was reviewed by all internal departments within administration, as well as the town's insurer. The expression of interest pr uh, process, as mentioned earlier, uh, will help us to ensure that we have a diverse year round calendar, calendar of events for the community. Organizing internal resources and having the appropriate staff structure uh, will help to improve customer service and mitigate risk to the town when it comes to hosting third party events. The supervisor of recreation will assume responsibility for events that are hosted at the event center. And the addition of a new position of recreation programmer will streamline the event process for event organizers and will assist in coordinating the numerous resources required to safely execute events on town property. The special event re review team consists of members of administration and its purpose is to provide knowledge and guidance to event organizers so that events are execu executed safely and successfully. <clears throat> the CERT committee assists in streamlining special event applications and the town approval process for event organizers while enhancing the coordination of municipal services. Internal guidelines and communication processes, such as the development of booking timelines and conducting regular interdepartmental information meetings, help to make the process as efficient as possible for third party event organizers. And the digitization of various services is assisting in acquiring and sharing consistent event information from event organizers. So for example, uh, there has been a digital, digital form created for event organizers uh, to develop their safety plan. This will ensure that we're asking for the same information from each organizer and the members of the CERT committee will receive the information in a consistent format at, um, for each event. We've updated and created new user fees, which are uh, located in Appendix E. <clears throat> Some of the changes to the uh, previous fee structure for rental fees and events and practices, including charging all rental fees related for events, so all space used. Uh, in past practices, there were certain um, areas that at times were not charged. So for example, pre-event storage um, or use of concession, those types of things. Uh, additionally, we will charge fees for setup uh, and teardown time, which was not always charged consistently in the past. With the exception of the event center, fees have been changed to an hourly rate from a flat rate. Uh, this will ensure that event organizers only book the necessary time uh, and will allow multiple bookings per day when applicable. Uh, and then I would like to note that there is an error in Appendix E. Um, for the event center fee, uh, it was inadvertently excluded on the um, spreadsheet. The fee being proposed is $1,200 per day and is in line with the fees charged at similar event spaces. All the fees for events and rentals will be charged consistently in, in accordance with the user fee bylaw. And again, only basic amenities will be offered as mentioned earlier. Requiring event organizers to rent event supplies and equipment will reduce the cost to the town to deliver events. The event plan that's been developed for 2022 was based on the public engagement process for the waterfront and include, is based on the feedback um, 
that identified food trucks, live music, and markets as the three uh, most requested events to see at the event center. These pro proposed events also expand upon our current events um, that already have an event framework in place, or they involve relocating an existing event. This will maximize our staff efficiencies. And lastly, this plan takes into account a contingency for construction delays. So we're proposing for 2022 that only events um, uh, hosted and developed by the town of LaSalle be uh, offered so that we're not affecting a third party event organizers event should construction delays continue. This slide um, depicts uh, the event plan uh, for the event center to start out. I would like to note that this was developed last year uh, and at that time we anticipated being open for the summer months. So you will see events planned beginning in May, uh, but it, at this point um, it looks as though uh, August is more likely a timeline when we will have access to the facility. So the events that are currently indicated in May, um, June and July will not be hosted. So looking at this event, you see that we are offering um, some events coming um, <clears throat> throughout the year. But in the next slide, you'll note that this is all of the events that we anticipate being hosted within the Town of LaSalle based on pre-COVID um, events. So trying to offer a, a balance of activities that's not gonna overwhelm all of our departments and ensure that we're able to um, be successful in what we offer. Um, it provides us kind of a visual to give us um, the number of events, um, <clears throat> a visual of the number of events that we can anticipate hosting or supporting. Uh, it also um, doing some of these smaller events at the event center will allow us to create awareness and exposure for the event center while minimizing the impact on our existing staff workloads until we're able to put additional positions in place to support the event center. The next steps uh, after this evening, um, should everything be approved, would be to implement the event hosting policy and the new fees as we continue to book third party events in. To recruit and hire the new position to support the third party events within the town. Begin planning for events at the event center uh, and um, conduct the expression of interest process for 2023. That concludes my report. I'm certainly available uh, should there be any questions. Um, and again, what um, we're asking for this evening is to approve the event hosting policy as presented, to approve the changes to the fee schedule and the new fees for the event center, and the approval of the creation of a new position uh, of recreation programmer. Thank you, Ms. Venero. Mr. Miller, should we like to add something? Uh, again, just, just two comments for members of council. Certainly, uh, as, we, as we begin the adventure uh, uh, at the event center on the waterfront, we are taking a very much a very similar approach that we took when we opened up the Vollmer, and that is going to be a, a stepped approach. Uh, you know, we're easing into it, if you will, uh, because we, we really make, we want to make sure that we don't fall down and that we want to continue to build on it on success. So easing into it is, is how we intend on doing it. Um, and and we're, again, we're following the same practice that we have uh, with, with uh, when we opened up the Walmart. Uh, the other side is, I, while I appreciate the accountant-like uh, display on the last two slides, for the events, <laughs> uh, we will provide that to council subsequently to see. And I think what uh, what Ms. Fenero is uh, is referring to is, you know, we, we have a, a number of events that are happening, and it does tend to add and accumulate over time. And so uh, we will provide that those two slides in particular back to council so that uh, they'll be able to to uh, you know us accountants we love it. Dale and I we're all over this, but uh, but uh, again, so we're doing our job there with uh, with Patty. It's working really working all well. But uh, but on on a serious note, we will provide provide that to council so that there's a better idea of of the number of events that we have going on on a monthly basis because I was when we when we reviewed that uh, last year I was quite shocked at the number of events that we do that we just don't realize and so that is one of the things that, uh, that certainly uh, is some awareness for members of council um, it's certainly a, a positive thank you Mr. Militia yeah, we'll start with Councillor Dicho Spagnolo uh, before we go there, Patty, can you not share your screens, please? Thank you, through you. Um, to Mrs. Fanaro, I just have a couple of questions. So one, um, you did state, I know um, that you will be sending the, the actual um, rental fees, but 
you stated it was twelve hundred dollars a day for rentals. Okay, so that's good. And then, do you uh, has the town ever explored anything for nonprofit organizations, like a a lower rate, or do we not do that? That's one question. Thank you for the question. We have uh, explored that option in the past. Uh, we we uh, did find that most of the events that we were hosting tended to be for nonprofit organizations. Uh, so that fee that we developed did take that into account. And then through you, uh, again, to Ms. Monaro, just another question. I'm actually looking at hosting an event there um, in October, November. So I am looking I, at your sponsorship doc here on your, on your list here. So, does the organization, so does my committee have to seek approval for sponsorships? As it states, it says event organizers are seeking, that are seeking sponsorship opportunities for their event must obtain written approval from the town in advance. So is that something that we have to get approval then from the town in order for us to go seek sponsorships outside of LaSalle, like businesses, companies? I'm just gonna pass that over to Mr. Bison who assisted in developing the fee schedule. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So yes, that was part of the policy. Um, it was more to make sure that sort of the sponsors that were uh, aligning with events, there wasn't potentially a conflict or um, you know some something that would put the town in a precarious position. So um, it's not that we would say no that that person can't sponsor you. It was more that there would be collaboration that the event organizer would make us aware of sponsors so that we were aware, and we we're also. Uh, aware of sort of what the sponsorship entailed and it didn't uh, negatively maybe impact where they're asking our staff to hang up signage or do other things that uh, we were aware of the sponsorship, what was required and it wasn't presenting any issue for the town. Okay, thank you very much. Good questions, thank you. Any other council questions? Councilor Akpata. Thank you, Worship. Uh, through you to Patty. I received an email. It's now 426. We missed 420. So a resident of the town said, what are we going to do when it's time to have a cannabis festival? It's legal. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be smoking because it could be edibles. It could be flour. How will the town react to that? And have we looked at the Cannabis Control Act to make sure that whatever we're doing is compliant with insulating the town with this new legal substance that's coming forth so that if we have cannabis fest, I know they can't smoke under the Smoke for Ontario Act, but edibles, the flower, the seeds, and all these other things that just happened in other municipalities six days ago. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Councillor Akpata. Uh, in all honesty, I, I have not looked um, in detail. My understanding, uh, my limited knowledge right now is that that you cannot, we would not be able to host a festival in which you could consume it on site, but I may be wrong in that. But certainly that is the purpose of having the special event review team. So um, as things come on board that are new to us and that we are not sure what direction we would like to take, we would bring those through the committee, uh, the special event review team, and certainly through you know, senior, senior management and our legal department uh, before we moved forward and approved uh, any event of that nature. Supplemental your worship. I, I love that answer. And maybe it's possible that we could start that process to insulate the town before something or someone requests it to make sure that we have the appropriate understanding of the regulations, the legislation. I've got the regulations up right now and consumption is uniquely, is interestingly defined in the regulations. I'm not a lawyer and I wouldn't put our lawyer on the spot by asking him what consuming means right now, but I've got to believe that some of the things I saw in other municipalities sooner or later, a request most likely would come. And at least if we have an understanding of what our obligations are, due diligence, protect the public, things of that nature. I would appreciate that. Thank you, Your Worship. Good question, Councillor Akpata. Thank you. Councillor Reno. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm just looking for a little bit of clarification. Um, on your slide, you talked about $1,200 for the event center for the day. Um, there's a lot in this this package. It is a really big package with a lot of arms and and some of the arms I'm, I'm ready to move forward with right away. And as uh, Councillor Akpata has has alluded to, there may be some other arms that might not be ready yet. Um, so just a, a quick question. I see in here that the three lines for the event center that were left blank were actually the event center, 
the setup teardown time and the plaza. Is it fair to say based on the $1,200 that that is just for the event center? Um, is there a further rental fee? Is there going to be a rental fee for the parking lot that's attached to that event center? Because I see a parking lot uh, fee for a Balmer one, or I assume it's a Balmer one. It just says under hospitality, parking lot number three. I, I'm not sure if that's the one at the Balmer. I just assume if someone wanted to have a small festival at the Volmer that you know we got to cover our hydro and stuff and I understand all that um, but just in in relation to the event center I, I realize that there are event planners chomping at the bit we've got one right at our table that's ready to go and 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 I've gotten emails from other event planners that are ready to go so I I appreciate the fact that we <coughs> need to get the right staff in in place and I appreciate the fact that we need to get their fee structure in place my biggest question, I guess, aside from uh, the clarification on that cost, is what do you feel is going to be a realistic timeline if someone was to want to, let's just say July 1st, they want to have an event next year on July 1st. We know that they have to put in their information in February. You're going to have a review team go over it. What if they have... Uh, if if they want to be seen in front of council, what if they are a nonprofit that that uh, needs some help? Or for a great example, you know, we just partnered with Play for a, a Cure, which was a fantastic co collaboration for for our staff and with their organization. But if if someone wanted to come forward and ask for that type of um, um, partnership or that kind of help, realistically how far in advance do you think their timing line, timeline will have to be knowing that we have only four um, committee meetings per year, knowing that you will have this, this new uh, group together? How far in advance do you think if they had six months in advance that that should be plenty of time or will they need to be planning a year in advance? I'm just thinking about the high school groups or something that might need a little help and can't afford $500 for the parking lot for the day, but they want to do a pep rally or something. I'm just thinking about those smaller groups as one came to me today at Costco to complain about the town. And, and I, I took it all in and, you know, we'll discuss it later, but I just want to know how long of a, a, a planning timeline do you think they will need in order to, to, to make it through the whole system if they, if they needed help from council. Sorry if that's convoluted and big, but that's my question. Thank you for the question. Just if I could just clarify. So um, were you referring to the expression of interest process when you were talking about ne next July? So I, I just want to clarify um, the timeline. So for 2022, um, we would be looking at doing the expression of interest process for all of 2023. Uh, and then in subsequent years, we would get on the schedule that's listed in the expression of interest process. It wouldn't, it would be longer than six months that we would be. Um, so if we put that out in February, that would be for events that take place, if I just, let me find my notes here to just confirm. Um, so on February 1st, it would be for events taking place between January and June 30th. So February 1st of 2023 would be for events for January to June of 2024. So they would have, um, they would be requesting that a full year in advance. So that would give them um, lots of time to get through the system if there were various things um, that needed to be addressed or special requests that were going to be made. Um, that also gives us on, on the other side of things as they bring forward their emergency plans and the various aspects of their event, if there are things that need to be addressed through our various departments and perhaps be changed in their plan, that gives us time to go back to the organizers and make those adjustments. Uh, with respect to the parking lot fee, um, that is specifically for parking lot three, which if you'll recall, that is the parking lot we did um, put a lot of um, work into in order to host the Strawberry Festival. And since then we have had a request for uh, various organizers that would like to host events um, in that space. So again, the fee um, is for various things, um, not just for the hydro, it's for the disruption to our regular users that we would be closing down that parking lot. It, it you know, again, a lot of the things that were um, addressed tonight in terms of the various departments and the, the various time. Um, we did have an event recently where our culture and rec staff tracked their time um, working with the event organizer and the various uh, contractors that came through and it came close to about 25 hours of staff time for a one day event. So a lot of those fees, um, 
are, are developed, keeping in mind to be, you know, in keeping with other event spaces of similar size and nature, and also um, to sort of recoup uh, some of the costs for um, us conducting these events on our property. Okay, supplemental. So, um, so we have a group comes forward that wants to do something in 2024 now, comes in 2023, puts their plan in and gives you all what they think are going to be the expectations of, and you're going to create a, a, a schedule of fees for the staff time and things like that. Is, that. is that the way I'm understanding this? Because you're saying you don't want, I do remember in the presentation, you say we will capture all appropriate fees. So, in, in an event like that, where they had all these overruns of our staff, are, is there going to be an upfront where we say, listen, if you really want to host this event, it's going to cost you, let's just throw a number, $8,000 because you're asking for this, that, and the other thing. It, is that all going to be done a year and a half in advance? Like, it just seems like, I, I respect the, the fact that there has to be a planning cycle, um, but it, it almost seems like it's cutting some people out of the loop that are that are in a shorter time span that may maybe only plan their events once per year or something like that i, I just it, it just seems like a lot to to approve all of this tonight for for my personal uh, opinion but um just i'm just concerned with the with the people that don't have a year and a half uh that know a year and a half in advance maybe they just know six months in advance will they still be able to host an event if, if they didn't get in by february Certainly, certainly. So the idea is, uh, particularly with the event center, because we do anticipate a lot of demand, that the expression of interest would sort of give us an idea of who's thinking of coming and so that we don't book, you know, back to back concerts that are, you know, one weekend after another or three car shows in a row or, you know, just to give examples that we want to try to offer some variety in there. But certainly after we go through that process, it's likely that all weekends wouldn't be full. And so then we would go back to that first come first serve sort of uh, system of booking. And if there is uh, sub, uh, you know, certainly sufficient time that we can get them through the process and it's less than what's outlined um, in the expression of interest process, then we would move forward with that. Uh, however, I will note that one of the practices that we have always um, adhered to, and we do have that in the policy as well, is that if you book your event and host it in the town, we typically give you first right of refusal to come back. Most event organizers want to know if they're going to bring their event to our community that, you know, if they're making that transition, they want to be able to book there year after year if it's successful. Uh, so that's so where some of those timelines start to come from, because we need to know if you if you brought your event in 2022 and you're coming back in 2023, we sort of need you to make a commitment so that we can look at what other events are coming into place. Councillor Dietro Spagnolo. Sorry, through you um, to Ms. Finaro again. Just one question. I had mentioned that um, we're looking at doing an event in October, November. So would we set a meeting, like my committee come to you to have a meeting so then you can approve this event in October, November on availability? So you're looking at the event center to host uh, an event this, this October and November. Yes, that's why. When, when Councillor Reno mentioned that, I'm like, oh, Maybe it's not feasible, but when we were speaking and when we did the tour and um, the engineers had indicated that everything would be ready in July-ish, um, I, I think I mentioned it to somebody that maybe we can do an event here. Normally, the event that I'm talking about is taking place at the Windsor Airport hangar. However, why not utilize this beautiful new event center in Los Angeles? So my committee would love to just come in and have a tour of this. Um, so I, I guess that's a, a conversation you and I can have uh, at another time, but I just wanted to know, is would that be feasible to have this event in October, November of this year? Again, thank you for the question. I, I think the challenge, and I, I certainly will look to Mr. Militia and Mr. Mara on this, is that we don't have uh, a guarantee of when the construction will be done. Uh, we are trying to plan our own events as well and hope to hold those there, but um, that's sort of our reluctance in, in opening it up to the general public to say, do you want to host your events? Because what if it's not? Then we're sort of letting down you know, organizations, whereas if it's our own internal event and then we find out, oh, you know, it's not going to be ready, it's it's us, we can cancel it. We haven't really affected other people's events. We don't really want to go down that path where we could be potentially upsetting someone's event, but I'm not sure if Mr. Mara okay. has something further to add. Mr. Mara. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, 
we are working with the contractor. We have been uh, for some time. Um, it has been a difficult um, go at uh, construction this past uh, two years. Uh, there's been a number of delays with respect to materials, uh, trades, and things of that nature. At today, when I speak today, um, certainly they are looking at uh, completing it sometime in July into August. But there is some uncertainty there where there may be some additional delays, and that's what we continue can, are continuously working with uh, with respect to the contractor. So we are pushing uh, the best we can at this point in time to uh, move that uh, project forward. So it, it's what what Ms. Finero has presented was providing that opportunity to not negatively affect some large external event where there is some some negativity or negative uh, uh, feedback uh, from that nature. So that that is why Ms. Finero has put it put it in this fashion for 2022, uh, just to build in some certainty uh, with respect to uh, to kind of delivery of timelines for the contractor and, and uh, things of that nature. Any other council questions? Deputy Mayor Malash. Thank you, Mayor Bonnie. Uh, I really like the presentation. I do think it's gonna help streamline things, especially with the new event center coming on, because I think that's a whole other beast that we're not prepared for really. <laughs> Um, so good luck with that. Um, my only concern um, is the comment actually Miss um, Richie Spagnolo mentioned about the advertising and businesses. I almost see that as a hindrance and actually more work for administration if we have to vet every person who wants to sponsor or advertise at an event. I don't know if that's normal because I don't plan events, but that just it's... I, I believe that, and again, I'll, I'll turn to Mr. Bisson, but uh, I, I believe we're trying to get away from, and, and again, for those that are Formula One fans, there was a time where um, cigarette manufacturers were on every vehicle, and now they're on no vehicles. Uh, so that is the type of thing that, you know, if you had a major cigarette sponsor that came in and wanted to sponsor your health expo, we would likely have an issue with that with that type of sponsorship opportunity. I think that's what we're trying to guard against, but I will let uh, Mr. Bisson speak a little more, probably hopefully fluently than I did on that. Thank you. Uh, so just to, to go back to our previous example, um, you know, obviously when you're holding an event, you wanna have as much sponsorship as possible to help offset your cost. And obviously uh, there's good opportunities to develop relationships uh, between you know, private entities and, and your organization that you're holding an event. Um, one of the other considerations beside that that was uh, mentioned by the CEO is that um, you may sell sponsorship um, for uh, product place or product placement or logo placement when it's not your facility uh, or, or your property. And we just want to be aware of those things so that we can approve them. Uh, if you want a logo potentially hung somewhere or in the ice, there's work related to that and disruptions to our schedule. So it's just trying to make sure that we're collaborating with the organizer and that uh, the town's not put in a tough position of trying to deliver upon someone else's sponsorship agreement. Uh, thank you, through you. Yeah, I host several events a year through different organizations and charities. Um, so I completely understand that. It, 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 when I read this, I, I was a little confused on it too, just because with sponsorships like this event that I'm referring to, we, we raised about $250,000 just in sponsorships. But it's nothing to do with logos like that are going to be permanent um, structures in any in any of the uh, the environment at the event center. It was mainly just depending on the rate of your sponsorship. You might have balcony view. You might have twenty five VIP in a lounge area, like things like that that our decorator and and our uh, event or sorry our um, our committee would organize. But yeah, I understand that part. I was just a little bit confused because that would take a lot of time because we. We reach out a lot to a lot of different businesses and companies throughout the community, and it would just be a lot of time consuming to your department um, if we had to tell you a list of every single sponsor that we're approaching that denied us, requested or approved us. So that, that's what I was referring to. But thank you for the clarification. Deputy Mayor Malosh. I was just going to say, is that something maybe we should look at the wording in what we're putting through to to somehow change that obviously like approval for anything permanent or staff required or something like that. Just like I said, 
I only look over there because I know how many events they plan in a year and how many sponsorships they deal with. Um, and I just, I'm afraid that it's just going to become too much on our own staff if we are vetting each and everything that comes past us. So maybe just a change in the wording. Ms. Fenero or Mr. Militia? We can certainly we can certainly review the wording, but just to be clear, we're not we're not expecting to review every single sponsor that an event has. What we're trying to prevent is from an organization making an agreement for sponsorship and then it and then coming to us and saying, "Well, I've already sold this sponsorship, and now I need you to hang this sign, or we want to paint something somewhere, or um, you know put things up on your digital sign," without checking with us first. There's probably very few examples where we would say, no, we can't accommodate that. We just wanna make sure that organizers understand we have to have that conversation. Um, and that would certainly be something, you know, with it in the policy, that would be something that, that happens as part of our pre-event meetings that we would review those types of things. Um, and we would have staff available certainly to answer those questions, but we can certainly review the language and see uh, if there's a way to make that uh, clearer. Does that answer your question? Councilor Reno. Thank you, Worship. Um, just uh, two things. First of all, uh, the date of our next uh, Parks and Rec committee is this month, correct? We have one in May? May, correct. Okay. Um, I would like to make a motion that we table this for today, um, that this be brought back to the committee uh, and possibly be broken up into a couple smaller pieces um, and so that we can see each each line separately. I do honestly believe that we need to get our staff in, in place and we do need to have plans in place, but I think this is a lot to just pass in one false swoop. So I'm not ready for that. So I would like to make a motion that we bring this back to the Parks and Rec Committee and then uh, return to council at a, at a, at a later date um, with, with, with it broken down into smaller pieces. That's it. Okay, we have a motion by Councilor Reno. Deputy Mayor, Deputy Mayor Milage. Um, I'd be okay with that because I'm not on the Parks and Rec Committee, so I don't know if for them if this would be helpful to kind of dissect it a little bit more. But I, my thought is if we were to do that, maybe we could look at approving Appendix D, which would be the hiring, because I think that's going to take a bit longer of a process to get you a person in place. Um, and that way they're prepared and maybe even could be part of the rest of the discussion as we go along too. I don't know if that's helpful or if that actually works against you. I just thought it might, I know how hiring has been lately and it's a little bit more of a challenge. Certainly that would be helpful to start the process, but I think one of the challenges what we're going to find is that um, certainly we can bring it back to, to Parks and Rec and then, and then eventually come back to council. But you're looking for that's probably going to be a six week turnaround when we do that. So the likelihood that we are going to have any significant events in 2022 will be significantly diminished because we just won't have enough time to start the process and get things rolling, even from our own side of things. So we can we can certainly do that, but just I want to make sure we temper expectations that if if the idea is that we want to we want to get things moving in 2022. Uh, I, I think that um, referring it back to the committee may potentially cause some delays with that. Uh, certainly the, the addition of staff will help mitigate that. There's no doubt about that because we can start to work through some of those issues. But this, I mean, again, if I was the staff member that was hired and I don't know anything about planning uh, events, but if I was the staff member that was hired, I would say, well, what policy am I working under? What, do you, what, what are the rules that I need to work under? And, and so there will be some activity that they'll be able to do, but it will take some time. Councillor Carrick. Um, I'm okay with the policy the way it is. I think uh, if we need to nip and tuck down the road, we can do that, but I would not want this to go back and have the waiving of fees for events being waived without it coming before council. I think that's a council decision because at the end of the day, it's councillors. It's uh, a <clears throat> town to sell residents money. It's not our money to give away. So that still needs to be vetted, those kind of things. And uh, everything is has a cost. So again, if that's not part of what we want to move forward to, I, I can't support that. So I think that um, I would support the, the uh, recommendation the way it is. Thank you. 
I'll just throw a comment in now. I think the intent of the Parks and Recs Committee, or sorry, Patty Fanero's um, presentation, the intent is they're covering the town by putting that we have to prove the sponsorships. I think we have to look at what the intent is. And sometimes what's written is not what is intended. Um, to delay this, I, I agree with Mr. Militia, we may miss some events. I don't think that, and, and correct me, if, so on that part, let me get that point and I'll go to the other one, is I think your intent is honorable in that, to Mr. Militia's example, cigarette manufacturer at our health expo. No, we're not gonna okay that. And, and Patty, you explained it. If somebody comes and they say, yeah, well, you're supposed to paint this on the ice or put it on your signs, we didn't know about that. So I think the intent is, no, you don't gonna vet every sponsor that uh, Vitro Spagnolo brings you're, it's just a matter of that type of event. It's everybody's giving money from their foundation or wherever. So I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the intent and the language. I'm not gonna sit here and dissect it. And I think it's one of those things where it's, a, it's gonna be a living issue. You look at it and go, okay, this, this is good. We're gonna approve it. This is a bad one. We don't want it. We don't want that at all. Maybe it's a cannabis. I don't know if we can or not, but I know you're gonna be looking into that. That's point number one. Point number two, any changes we make should come back to council. I don't want it to go to the, the, fire, the Parks and Recs Committee, but I, I agree with Councillor Carrick. We should approve this, move forward, do the hiring. Let's get as many events in there as quickly as we can. And with that, I have a question. When you say for 2024 event, you want them to put in a, a request in 2023, January. I'm assuming that's a big event. I don't think if I want to have my... 65th birthday party there and invite that's a big event <laughs> <laughs> okay joe militia's 50th birthday i don't think it's going to take six months eight months to prove that if it's available and we apply and say here's a birthday party you available on the saturday yes great am i correct in that it's yes. it's a long tail for a big event but nothing small Correct. Okay. I don't want people that listening to this going, well, we can't go to the event center because we just found out we only have eight months to go. Okay. So for clarification, it's some big events. All right. Um, Councillor Dicho Spagnolo. Thank you through you. I support the recommendation as is. Uh, I just want a clarification on the sponsorship, but I think it's great that what you, um, what you put out here. And I think it's great that you're going to be meeting with the organizers anyways, to have that discussion and, so I support it the way it is. I, it would be uh, horrible to uh, miss out on some potential events that are going to be coming and things that you guys have planned. Um, so I'll support it uh, with, with Councillor Carrick. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Malosh. I don't think a formal motion was made, so I was going to make a motion to move what was presented to us today, allowing uh, Ms. Fenero and her department to tweak it as needed so that, you know, it, it's an inviting piece of paper that doesn't confuse our residents on when they can book and what kind of sponsorship and whatnot and leave that to your department to handle. So I'll move everything that's been recommended. Okay, moved by Councillor or Deputy Mayor Malash, support by Councillor Dicho Spagnolo as needed. I don't know if you have to throw in there because you're gonna we have to put that in, Madam Clerk. No. Okay. Are we good with that? All in favor of the motion as presented on all four. Against, we have one against, that carries, thank you. We go on the update to policy for waiving or reducing fees related to use of town owned facilities and spaces. Ms. Finero. Thank you, your worship and members of council. The policy for waiving or reducing fees related to the use of town owned facilities uh, was approved at the February 8th, 2022 council meeting. Uh, however, after that meeting, an error in the policy was identified. Uh, the purpose of this report is to correct the error and update the policy. The original policy identified the Parks, Recreation and Events Committee as having the authority to waive or reduce fees. Um, however, requests for the waiver or reduction of fees shall be initially submitted to the committee uh, for consideration and the committee may request additional information, make a re recommendation to council to approve the fee reduction or waiver request in whole or in part or deny the request. Um, uh, the committee has no authority to actually approve the request that as it is outlined in the parks, recreation and events committee terms of reference. 
Deputy Mayor Malash. Move the recommendation. Support by Councilor Akpata. Question? All in favor? That carries unanimously. Thank you. Fire Committee meeting March 24th, 2022. Chief Deason. I don't have any additional uh, comments or information on this. Um, okay. I, think, I think it's typically Councilor Reno that speaks on this, right? I will ask Mr. Reno to say a few words, Chair. <laughs> I will thank you, Your Worship. Um, the meeting that we had, uh, we, we spoke uh, a lot about mandatory firefighter certification. And this is something that's coming down uh, the pipe where basically um, all firefighters are going to have to reach a certain level. The good news is, is that our people have always been reaching those levels and it's going to be a very easy transition for us uh, compared to some other groups that had different uh, criteria and different uh, levels. So um, I think it's pretty safe to say that things are going to be smooth for us in our transition moving forward. We had that annual report as well um, that talked about uh, trends and things like that. You know, COVID uh, at some times kept people on the phones and then kept people off the phones. But in, in general, um, things are, are moving as expected and uh, there were no major uh, concerns uh, brought forward at that meeting. So um, those are the two big things to be aware of. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Reno. Council's pleasure. <laughs> Moved by Councilor Akbata. Support Councilor Edicio Spagnolo. All in favor? That carries. Thank you. Okay. Um, Parks and Rec and Events Committee meeting February 17th, 2022. Uh, we'll have Councillor Akpata give us comments and then we'll ask Ms. Finero for her comments. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, probably one of the most important things that took place was the, present the presentation of the annual report. Um, Ms. Finero and her staff broke down the use of our Parks and Rec facilities times in a manner that was easily consumable and shareable. Bottom line from my perspective is that we are doing what our facilities are supposed to do in supporting our community all the way through these past tough years we've had with all the changes and ups and downs. The annual report clearly outlines that the best bang for the buck is here in LaSalle in our parks and rec department. And it's because of the staff that uh, Ms. Fenero has and that we have the privilege of working with. So Patty, like I said, we, we went over in depth the annual report. I'll turn it to you to see if you have any other comments. Ms. Finero. Thank you. Yes, I did just want to draw your attention to this report. Um, and I did want to note that, that this report was created uh, in collaboration with the Public Works Department. It was a joint effort. Um, and the intention of the report uh, is to, to do exactly as Councillor Akpata said uh, and provide a visual of um, some various metrics. Um, I did also want to point out that we are able to share these metrics um, in, in a large part because of the software upgrade that we did to our active net registration software in March of 2021. Uh, so we are seeing um, some very uh, big benefits from having that and able to track those metrics. Uh, and certainly our intention um, as we move forward is to be able to track year over year. So we'll be able to um, share that information uh, both with the committee and with council. Um, and then another um, nice piece that comes with it is that it is very visual um, beyond just the graphs. Um, there's, there's a lot of uh, wonderful pictures that we take throughout the year um, that we were able to share and some really nice feedback as well um, from some of our users, from some employees that were moving on. Um, and we are continuing to work on um, gathering that qualitative data as well that we'll be able to share more of that in the future. Thank you, Ms. Fenero. Deputy Mayor Malash. Thank you, Mayor Bondi. Uh, through you to Ms. Finero, it was a great report. It really was appreciated between you and um, I forget what department you just said, Parks Department. Right. So uh, Public Works. So I, I do appreciate the report. It was great to see and the visuals was very nice to have. It's something nice to be able to present if you ever needed to. Um, my question, and I'm, I'm assuming this may be the reason, um, this was a February meeting and we're in April, kind of getting it a little late. And I don't know if it's because of the report, why we're receiving it so late. Um, but if there's a way to get our minutes sooner, just because we're almost at the end of April. So any events that you kind of showed in this package, we've kind of missed it. If we can get them ahead of time, that'd be great. 
And then my only, only other question was the Strawberry Festival. Uh, the change to admission gate, I think is fantastic. I've sat on that committee and understand the challenges that we faced with volunteers showing up, uh, worrying about keeping funds in a safe manner. Um, my only other, my only question to that is I do notice that we are still going to have um, partnerships with a couple of groups, obviously Bike Friendly Windsor Essex, that's kind of a given with the bike ballet. Um, and Life After 50 did an amazing job with strawberry and ice cream. I know the question is going to come eventually from other community groups asking if they still or will ever get that opportunity to be part of it and receive, I don't even know if we still do funds that go back to their community groups. So just kind of to prepare, we, those questions do come to us. Thank you for the question. Certainly that is the intention in the future because of the, um, the timelines with planning this year and the success that we've had with those two organizations. Um, uh, certainly bike friendly. Um, I don't know that there's a lot of organizations out there that can host a bike ballet. They, they have the necessary equipment and, and um, you know, manpower to do that. In terms of the um, strawberries and ice cream, there are some requirements for uh, food service certification. Uh, so that has been one of the benefits to working with an organization that uh, has an employee base um, that's there to manage that uh, throughout the weekend. But our intention is to open that back up uh, through an application process again in the future uh, when there's a bit more time. Uh, however, we will have to still continue to work through those requirements for food safety certification. Thank you. Council's pleasure. Oh, Councilor Reynolds, a question. Just want uh, wanted to comment uh, to Scott and to Patty. Thank you for uh, including the report. Um, we we had the uh, the pleasure of actually having the report uh, um, presented to us in the committee meeting, and uh, you know it is very dynamic and uh, it really does show the great things that have been happening. So um, we had asked in the meeting for it to be presented and to be brought forward, and it, it's here. It is. So thank you very much for including that. I think it's a great uh, a great tool. Thank you. Council's pleasure. Moved by Deputy Mayor Malash, support by Councilor Dujerle. All in favor? That carries unanimously. Thank you. Termination of the declaration of emergency. Finally. <laughs> Don't everybody raise your hands at once. Um, I guess anybody want to speak to it? It's pretty self-explanatory. Moved by Deputy Mayor Malash, support Councillor Dietrich Spagnolo. All in favor, that carries unanimously. Thank you. 2022 first quarter property tax write-offs. Mr. Longwa. Well, the first quarter of 2022 had very minimal write-offs under $3,000, which is good news. Um, and I'd be available for any questions. Council's pleasure. Moved by Deputy Mayor Malash, support by Councilor Reno. All in favor, that carries. Correspondence from the City of Cambridge dated March 31, 2021 regarding support for a moratorium on new aggregate operations. Motion received, Deputy Mayor Malash, support Councilor Akpata, all in favor, that carries, thank you. Correspondence from the City of Cambridge dated March 31st, 2021 regarding support for more, oops, I missed one. No, 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 we're good, number four. Correspondence from the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility dated April 5th, 2022 regarding nominations for the 2022 Ontario Senior of the Year Award. Deputy Mayor Malash, question. Um, I was wondering if we could receive and maybe forward it to our volunteer committee and if just in case they have any names we could put forward. Moved by Deputy Mayor Malash, support by Councillor Reno, all in favor? That carries, thank you. Reports. Mr. Mayor, we'll put you on the list after the 65 <laughs> birthday, <laughs> just for the record. I have an ethical question. <laughs> it's just a number. Um, summary of reports to council. Moved by Deputy Mayor Malosh, support. Councilor Dujerle, all in favor? That carries, thank you. Bylaws, before we get to the bylaws, please note that bylaw 8691 and bylaw 8696 will not be included in the following readings as they will be placed on a future 
agenda. The minutes will reflect this change accordingly. So we will be voting on 8692, 8693, 8694, 8695, 8697, and 8698 on all three readings. Moved by Councillor Carrick, support Councillor Desjardins. All in favor? That carries. Council questions. Councillor Desjardins. Thank you. Um, just uh, something that I've had questions on the last few days, uh, I, and I haven't been by the corner in the last week or so, so I'm not sure if something's spurred the questions. Sandwich West Parkway adjacent to the uh, Windsor Crossings have people asking about rumors that we're hearing. Is there anything that we can talk about uh, that's maybe going in there that we know publicly or things still under discussion? Um, I'm not sure who would take that. I don't know if we can say, Mr. Mara? At this point in time, uh, thank you for the question, but at this point in time, there has been no formal application submitted to the uh, to the town on any uh, proposed developments at that location. So there's uh, not much that we can share at this point in time. There's rumors going around. <laughs> and uh, in, until something's in writing, as Mr. Mara said, we can't say anything officially. Well, that's what I kind of figured, but I said I would ask, so I did. So I can just tell people that we don't have any formal applications. So when we know, they'll know. But something's coming. But something's coming. Correct. Okay. Okay. Any other council questions? Oh, Councillor Ekpata? Oh, you're going to wait for a statement? Okay. We've been away all this time. Only one question. I want to ask one, but I won't. Statements by council members. Councillor Ekpata. Thank you, Worship. Uh, since it was nice, I went out for a walk and I stopped by the bridge and, saw, and spoke to some of the ladies and gentlemen who were fishing. And one of the gentlemen showed me a video of how clear the water is. We could look down to the bottom and see the fish. So one of the things that this gentleman said to me when he recognized me and said some things that you know I should do, he said, whoever is cleaning up the water and enhancing the watershed in and around the town. You're doing a great job. Fisher people love it. And I just said, well, I will bring your remarks back to uh, back to council and let them know that uh, the people fishing off the bridge have noticed the water is cleaner. It is clearer, the fish are there. There's a lot of wildlife and activity going on and maybe it was COVID, maybe it was time. And I just wanted to say that they were very, very happy. And like I said, it was really nice to just walk up and tap somebody, didn't tap them, but just say, hey, how's it going? And get this great story about uh, watershed improvement and water and fish. And just wanted to let you know about that, Your Worship. Well, I guess we'll, we'll give kudos to uh, Peter Mara and uh, <laughs> Water Wastewater Division. We have no control over that. But, but the, <laughs> what do I say? Uh, Councillor Edicho Spagnolo. Thank you through you. Uh, I attended the spring fling on uh, Saturday and I just wanted to say that it was a great event. Um, very well attended. I had a lot of comments of people, random people just coming up just saying that it was a great event and they were happy to see that. So to kudos to you and your team for organizing a great event. Councillor Reno. <clears throat> the words have been taken out of my mouth. Um, yes, I wanted to to also say thanks to uh, the team. It, it seemed like something that happened really quickly, um, but a lot of people knew about it. And um, uh, so right from communication to execution, uh, congratulations on the spring fling. And uh, I did also have a chance to walk down and uh, enjoy the, uh, the, the magician. I really like the magician. So if we can invite him back for something else, because anytime a guy can wiggle out of a a straight jacket, I'm, I'm there. So congratulations, it was a great event and uh, many, many positive uh, online comments on, on my site, thank you. I'm sure he'd be more than welcome to, get, to uh, entertain us free for Joe Militia's birthday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Deputy Mayor Malosh. Uh, just to add on to that, I, I didn't get a chance to attend that day. Um, I drove past and the crowds were amazing. And the pictures people posted afterwards were even more fascinating to see what we did put on in such a short period of time. So absolute congratulations to you and staff and parks and everybody else who threw something together as quickly as we did. 
it always is sad when you go on Facebook, of course we do that, and you see comments from the community who go, we didn't know about it, nobody advertised. And yet, I know every member on council advertised, shared the information as well as you guys did a lot of work with it. And I'm not sure how else we're supposed to reach residents because I do hear it on several topics that they feel that we don't advertise well and I'm lost on how we're supposed to do any more advertising than we do. Um, but with that being said, it is great news to hear that the LaSalle Post is coming back or is back and hopefully with our partnership with them, maybe that'll help residents learn more of our amazing events that we put on because they missed a great one. I'm like you, I did not make it. I had issues to deal with at home, um, but I get comments often from non-residents saying, you guys always having something to do. The night market, uh, the movie nights, there's always something. And they, they're always saying, we're always looking online to see what's coming up next. They feel safe here. Our entertainment is first class. It's a nice drive. Some can take their bikes here, even if they're from out of town and not out of LaSalle. So it's, it's compliments that I don't pass along often, but now that they discuss it, it brings back my memory a little bit to say, it's not just the spring fling. There are all the events we host. The Christmas lights this winter, amazing. How many people said they came from out of town because they saw it on social media you got to drive by LaSalle, see the lights. So um, we're doing good. You're doing great. Keep up the good work. Um, any other statements? Reports from committees? Notices of motion? You have the meeting scheduled. That's it for tonight. It's been a while. Confirmatory bylaw, all three readings, Councillor Dietrich Spagnola and Councillor Akpata, all in favor? That carries, thank you. Thank you, Council and everyone in attendance. It's nice to be back, viewing audience. Thanks for